Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Today I'm going to be showing you how I made the iridescent trench coat from my lookbook last week, this buddy here. Uh, she's an interesting, it's an interesting project, an interesting fabric to try and work with, especially to try and make anything uh, more structured or substantial out of. Um, it was a, it was an interesting idea to begin with and I had a, a, a fun time. Now this fabric I'll be using today is a polyester, sort of a inexpensive, cheaper quality, almost like party organza. I think this is intended for children's costumes, maybe, but more just like as a tablecloth or backdrop fabric for parties and things like that. I don't think anyone intended this fabric particularly to be made into like couture coats. So I did have an interesting time trying to do so, but I have since found this very, a very similar iridescent kind of mylar fabric in a silk from a UK uh, seller. I have not tried the silk version yet because it is quite pricey. The shipping is quite pricey to the United States, but I just wanted to let you know that it does exist. So we'll go ahead and link the silk version as well as the polyester version of this organza in the description below. But I'll be working with the poly today and it was quite a fun time. Let's go ahead and jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. All right, here I am with my little sketch here with lots of details and top stitching and pockets, which ends up being <clears throat> not exactly as doable as I should like in the actual fabric today. So we'll be making kind of a more of a, um, what do they call it? A duster as opposed to an actual trench coat, like a little bit of a, a top layer. It's a bit more of a costume piece, as I've said for this one, as opposed to actually a very practical garment just due to the limitations of the fabric. But let me just trace my bodice block front here and then I'll start sketching in where I want the yoke to be, trying to decide how deep I wanted that yoke here on the front because, uh, you know, I added more seam lines than probably were advisable in this weird fabric. I'm going to keep my waist dart, but I'm gonna throw the side dart up here into that yoke. So the waist dart I'm just gonna ignore. I'm gonna leave that fullness in here so that this has space at the waist. Um, as opposed to adding a ton of extra ease, I'm just gonna leave that dart there. Um, that I would normally move. I'm going to raise the shoulder a quarter inch at the edge and then bring the uh, arm side out a little bit too as well, just to straighten that off. Again, you can create kind of a boxier thing when you're making a jacket. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. I am going to go ahead and cut this apart for now while I move my darts around and then I will end up making it long again. So, you know, in hindsight, why did I just cut that paper off? I don't know. So I could tape it on again later. Oops. Now I'm going to cut down my side dart to the apex and then I'm going to cut along my yoke just so I can close this dart here like so and close that side dart which will now be opened up into the yoke. I am actually not going to sew that dart today. I'm just going to fold it which you will see later but you see immediately I'm taping paper back on. So <laughs> why? I don't know. Um, again you could be more organized than me but alas I am not always uh, the order of operations only keeps up so quickly in my brain. I am going to lower the armhole a good five eighths of an inch, if not an entire inch here. Yeah, it's about an entire inch. And then bring it out an extra inch as well, just to give myself plenty of room around the middle of this buddy so that I can cinch it in with a belt later on. Of course, at this point, I was thinking I would make a belt out of this fabric, which in the end I did not because this fabric is just not stable enough for something like cinching. Um, <clears throat> anything. But I'm just going to extend this all the way down. Because it's wider anyway, it'll probably encompass my hip, but I'll just flare it from that underarm. Um, I, how much am I flaring that? Meh. Like, you know, enough. <laughs> this is one of those things where it's just like, uh, it's not an official process. I'm just creatively going and hopefully it will work. I am planning on making a mock-up for this, so flare it as much as you would like. The more flare you got, the more of a like swing coat or sort of a sort of Miss Maisel shape you're going to get, the more circular you make these pieces. Um, I just flared this a little bit, maybe, I don't know, seven degrees. Once again, it's not official, but I am just going to go ahead and lengthen this whole thing to be around 31 inches. There we go. Like so. And it, I mean, the side flares a tiny bit, but most of this is just straight across. I'll have to tape in some more paper here and make sure that this is also 31 inches and draw in my hem here. Take this paper, put it over here, you know, make it work. This is actually a very simple shape this jacket, it's just a weird fabric. So the, the, the weirder the fabric, the more simple the style lines is a good rule of thumb actually, because if you try to do something very complex and fiddly and then choose a very complex and weird fabric to work with, it's gonna be a combo of sadness. So the weirder the fabric, the easier the silhouette is usually not a bad rule to follow. All right, so along the center front here, I have two inches so far, but I'm going to add on more space so that I can have about an inch and a half 
of overlap past my center front plus I, like a fold back facing on the front of this. So I'm going to go ahead and just fold this along where I want the jacket to end. So again, this is about um, an inch and a half past center front and then just draw on the facing that I want the fold back. Basically, you can make this as deep. You can make it double breasted if you want to or as narrow as you want to. Um, this is just instead of having a separate placket piece, I just have a fold back placket and you'll see how this gets sewn later. But again, I'm just making this up as I go along. So is it very official? No. And I do still have my yoke attached to this right now, so it's getting extended as well, which is fine. It will all be done in a similar way later on. And then I can finally cut this yoke off and add seam allowance between the yoke and the main body of the front, of course, because anytime I cut my pattern apart and I want to sew it back together, I'm going to need a seam allowance in order to do so. So last, we will need this like so. And I can fill in this dart here now as well because I will be keeping this and I'm just going to pleat that closed because that's how I'm going to do it in fabric later as well before I put some seam allowance on here. Like so at like 800 times speed. I'm quick, but I'm not that quick. Tape down my floops on the other side here before they get caught in anything like so. So trench 22 front, eh, kind of front yoke front. And you can see along the side of the top of the screen there, I do have a good one inch added at the underarm and then it flares out from there. So it's probably a good three inches at the waist. Um, that's where that angle is just flaring out so that it will encompass my hips and have plenty of room. Again, I'm planning on mocking this up so I can tell if I need to add more, basically. I don't make a ton of outerwear, so I never really know how much ease to add because normally I don't add any ease to anything, as we know. Let me trace the bodice back here. And I'm just leaving two inches along the center back as well, even though I end up actually taking that fullness off, I believe. I can't exactly remember. We will, we will find out together. This was probably a month ago, at least uh, at this point, because I've been making all kinds of stuff for this last video. All right, trench back. Again, I put it in a deep yoke there. That'll be cut on the fold for sure. And I was just referencing my front to see what I had done to the shoulder. So I raised that again a quarter of an inch at the shoulder tip and then came out and just squared that off with the rest. So it's just a little bit less fitted up around the shoulder or a little bit bulkier or more geometric, I suppose. This is going to be a quite 1980s inspired little trench, little jacket duster thingy. I see these jackets. Here's some pictures of ones I've seen on Etsy all the time. And I do quite like them. There's something science fiction about them that it's kind of like that late seventies, early eighties science fiction -y look in these little nylon jackets. So it's kind of inspired by those for this jacket that I'm making today. If we can call this a jacket again, Weird iridescent cardigan-ish. Again, I'm just flaring this about the same amount that I did the front. And again, it's not via measurement. Uh, so you can see this is about four inches at the waist here. So it's, I guess, an extra inch of flare compared to the front. I lowered that armhole an inch again as well. But again, I'm just extending that hemline down to 31 inches along the center back here as well. I will actually just grab my front piece and line those up at the underarm here and just make sure I have everything as the exact same length and just trace that hem in so I can be sure it is the same as the front and that Everything will line up along the side seam where it needs to later on anyhow. And then I can cut my hem in on this buddy, like so. It's very slightly curved, not by much. This will be fully lined with the same exact fabric. So I'm going to be basically making a single layer organza version of this coat twice, and then I'll just line it with itself. So you'll see that. Once again, once I cut my yoke apart, I need to add seam allowance to that. So that's what I'm doing here. You can see I cut that extra two inches that was along the center back from the yoke off already like so mm, there we go got our seam allowance sorry i'm a bit scandalous in this video also i'm just wearing a tank top because this was the first day i had taken the plastic off of the line work on my arm because you can see i have chrysanthemums on my arm here i had just taken the um like saniderm bandage off of it this day so i wanted to let the tattoo breathe that it was new and now i just took the saniderm off again today because i finished this tattoo and got the shading this last week so fun not that peeling the sanitarm off is very fun here's the tracing of my standard sleeve i'm just going to separate that into four equal parts um, just because i want to make this a little bit bigger all around uh just so that it fits into that armhole that i lowered and widened a bit since i lowered that armhole about an inch widened it about an inch for both the front and back this needs to be widened as well so that it will still fit in there um i might be able to like fudge it but it's better to just straighten off the sides and open it up a little bit so i'm just straightening off the sides of my sleeve here to make a little bit bigger sleeve instead of it tapering you can see that elbow dart i'm just ignoring it at this point so i'm just straightening everything off from my standard sleeve i will put a um, link in the card here to my 
standard sleeve drafting if you would like to draft a basic block sleeve for your bodice as well and i will cut this out i'm actually going to raise the sleeve cap a tiny bit so i started cutting this out and then i left it so i'm just going to raise the sleeve cap a half inch and then ease that in uh, just because again my sleeve is just a little bit bigger here so just doing that and i lower it here but then i think i forget to cut off <laughs> the front so you know yes i do look at that so you know you would think sleeves are very particular but not in a uh, larger garment like this where it's like an over thing so here i am playing around the sleeve cap seeing how much I, that added it really doesn't add much at all to raise it a half inch like that you'd be surprised um i thought if anything if the sleeve ended up too big i could just put a little bit of gathering in the top of the sleeve and that wouldn't bother me so that's fine i'm just gonna go ahead and split this down the middle add in a half inch and then tape it back together <laughs> instead of just adding space at the sides you kind of want to almost grade the sleeve up this is kind of how pattern grading is done instead of just adding a little bit of extra room at the underarm seam you kind of want to distribute that width across the entire sleeve so i'm doing it in these three sections here where i split it down the middle and then down each side and then put in a little bit of space in each one here i'm adding in three eighths of an inch on either of the sides after adding in that half inch down the middle hopefully this makes any sense honestly i mean the majesty of this garment it's all in the iridescence so it's not like the pattern is groundbreaking or anything um it's just a little little top coat duster thingy tape down my floops make sure this is long enough actually i'm going to add on um, a good healthy amount of length to this so i can do a fold back cuff similar to how the front will be a fold back facing on the front of the garment i just wanted to have that match up here it looks actually really nice in the cotton muslin when i mock it up and did some top stitching i was like oh this would be so nice in a cotton but once trying to do the geometric funds top stitching onto the iridescence i learned hey maybe not trench 2022 version one that's what that says by the way version one version one i was anticipating i might need a version two and i'm just going to actually draft a quick pocket so i'm just drawing a large rectangle with an angled top you know that'll fold down like this it's a, it's not you know a pocket is just whatever shape you want it to be whatever size you want it to be uh, a lot of people will have questions about pockets i don't of course use them very often and in, in the end i won't put them on this garment today but i did use this pocket pattern later on for the navy blue coat that you see at the end of the video um but i did not get to include my pockets today you will still me see, still see me sew these <laughs> patch pockets but i don't put them on because it was going to create too many pulls and snags in this fabric so wasn't doing it but this is my pocket pattern it's just a big rectangle with an angled full back top so that's all but now i will cut this out of muslin and make a mock-up for myself so i can see how this is looking and here i forgot to draft a collar pattern so let's go ahead and do that real fast just tee off a line measure your back neckline mark that from the center back out on this here so that's the back neckline measure the front neckline where it needs to end not all the way to this fold back but where the center front will be yeah so like where the garment will end which is this red line here so i'm just gonna mark that on here as well and that's the front neckline and then we need to tip up a half inch with a french curve here so i'm just gonna do that in the front and that eases into the original line i'm gonna come up and make this collar two inches wide like so and then i'll add seam allowance to all of this as well um i've done a couple of stand collars here on the channel at this point i'm not sure which video has the best tutorial for it so i'll have to find which video has a good stand collar moment and i will link that in a card here because i'm just doing a quick stand collar here let's face it it's not very persnickety especially because i'm gonna be mocking it up so i know i can fix things if i have to later i'll cut that with the center back along the fold cut two of those in muslin which is much easier than an iridescent organza and my muslin looks like this you can see i only bothered to cut out one sleeve why waste the muslin fabric for both sleeves you know um, so just wanted to see if this was enough fullness around the hips and it is fine it's plenty of fullness at the waist i'm just gonna kind of arrange the gathering at the waist by pulling this the way i want it to be basically and i did sew the back extra fullness along the center back into a pleat this time but i ended up just eliminating that fullness because i didn't think i needed it um, but this is what this looks like <laughs> right now of course with some red heels and pajama pants and one sleeve it's really quite a look you know um <laughs> on the of course trashy set and by trashy set i mean tra set full of trash and i did quite like my pocket and i had hopes about including pockets on this 
So I cut them out. I cut out four layers of that pocket pattern piece, basically. So I can sew two together here. I'm just going to bag line these, basically. Um, but in the end, we don't end up using these. But it's a good, you know, first playing around with this fabric. I did use this fabric to line some sleeves earlier in the year. And then I used it to line the hood for that other sateen little hood collar garment vest weird thing. I'll be showing you that one in the new year um, garment. So I've used this fabric before, but it is... You know, you forget how frustrating these things are until you go back to them and you're like, oh yeah, that's right. Yikes. But I also cut out my collar piece here in this organza. Cut out two of those along the fold so I can um, sew those together along the top outside edge. And then I can start taking all the pins out of my other stuff. Look at me thinking I was going to put belt loops on this. No, no, I'm not. But I'll go ahead and pin my back yoke onto my back. And you, you can see I've removed the extra fullness that was along the center back here because... There's nothing to contain. The yoke just fits onto the back piece and fits me like so. So I need to do that twice because one layer for the outside, one layer for the lining. Of course, they will look the same. I'm just going to have all my rough edges sandwiched together inside. And this fabric is very sheer, of course. So uh, any seam allowance gets kind of seen, but also it's so blinding, this fabric, that you really can't see the seam allowance unless you're looking incredibly close. So I'm not worried about it. This would probably be easier to do in one layer of organza and then line it with something like actually, you know, reasonable and some sort of like a rayon or even polyester lining. Why not? It's not like this fabric isn't polyester. Polyester lining is cheaper than rayon lining. So, you know, bring those pockets over here to the machine and go ahead and start stitching those. I'm using dark green thread on all this today because, I mean, honestly, I could use any color almost, but I wanted to be able to wear this with navy or with black. So I didn't want to use black or navy thread, so I used dark green, which I figure matches both navy and red. When I was coming around the corners, as you can see, when I get to a corner, I just leave the needle down, uh, pick up the presser foot, move whatever I'm sewing, um, then put the presser foot back down, needle, keep going. That's just how I move around corners. And I'm just leaving a tiny bit of the bottom of this pocket open so that I can turn these right side out. Technically, you need to clip your corners and stuff like that in this, but in this fabric, it frays a lot, so... Ugh risky business in this fabric, which wants to fray quite easily. I'm just using a piece of boning and then a knitting needle to poke out my corners and kind of press this into submission. Um, and these were my cute iridescent pockets that there's, I'm, I, mm, <laughs> I wanted to use them. Okay. But I, in the end I did not because after getting the rest of the coat together, like putting the pockets on was going to be my last step anyway. And after getting the rest of it together, it had, I had hit even with like a brand new needle, a brand new Microtex needle, which is what I'm using for this, something quite sharp, I was still getting snags in this fabric because this fabric is made out of very, very, very thin black polyester crossweave. And then the other threads on this are just pieces of mylar. Like if you imagine iridescent cellophane to wrap like a bouquet of flowers or to put when you're wrapping a present or make a bow out of, um, that's what this thread is made out of. It's just very thin sheets of iridescent plastic, Christmas tinsel with a little bit of fabric, like wannabe fabric. <laughs> it's not real fabric. It's wannabe fabric. Um, and then for the darts here, you can see I just folded it where it would need to be uh, like a pleat. And then I just pressed it. So I didn't actually have to sew these darts up here. It's the same as if I had sewn a dart fit wise, but it's just a little pleat up here. So hopefully that makes any sense. Like so. I was thinking, do I want to, um, you know, base this anyway? No. So before I sew my front yoke on here, I'm just folding those darts into place, pressing them, of course, melting it a little bit because this is just plastic fibers. So you have to be really careful when ironing this stuff because it will melt if you have that iron too hot. Same over here. I'm just going to fold that dart shut like so. Give it a good press. And that's my dart for the front done. <laughs> Nothing more epic than that. It, 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 because the threads are not like a normal thread where the needle will just push it aside, this is like a, imagine a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of plastic ribbon. The needle gets snagged on it just so easily while you're sewing it, um, and it pulls the threads out of whack, and it just doesn't stay smooth easily. Um, there probably are specialty needles that could handle this, but, you know, I'm making a costumey piece. I'm not really trying to go couture about this. If I bought that fancy very expensive silk version of this, I would want to figure out what needle is best. I had too many projects going on at once, including building that entire set. So one only has so much bandwidth for these things. <laughs> and uh, if any of you know what the best needle is to use with plastic, let me know, you know? 
Here's my top stitching along the front yoke on this side. See the little fold of a dart in there. At this point, I will go ahead and line up my fronts with the back along this long, long side seam. Again, the general construction of this is not, like the pattern is not difficult. It's just the fabrics I chose that make me have to make weird concessions and, um, you know, have to deal with the fraying and the pulling and the meh. But if I made this in like taffeta, it would do fine. So <laughs> I really should make another one of these in a fabric that's less irritating because it could be quite fun. Even if to make this in like silk organza, if you made this in uh, two layers of silk organza, which you could use like two layers of black or you could use a two different colors and it would look still quite iridescent. Not as iridescent as this because again, plastic just gives us things that natural fibers can't yet, sadly. And even the silk version of this fabric, by the way, it's still this mylar thread. It's just that the cross thread is silk instead of polyester. So it's still mostly plastic. It's just instead of being held together by polyester, it's held together by silk, but it's still going to be 50% poly. It's a, it's a blend. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, polyester, this plastic, or if it's mylar or nylon or some kind of nonsense, but it's, it's definitely plastic. So even the silk version of this is not all the way silk. They can't make this yet. Um, they have had some luck making glitters, I think, out of cellulose or like recycled paper cellulose stuff. So hopefully one day we can have fabrics this iridescent that are made out of recycled paper, but we're not there yet, sadly. But yes, you could make this out of silk organza if you wanted a um, more biodegradable project. But, um, and also an easier to work with. Honestly, silk organza is way easier to work with than polyester organza, I think. It just is really crispy and behaves quite well and holds it pressed quite well. Here I'm just sewing the underarm sleeves, the underarm seam of my sleeves for all four sleeves. I have a left and a right, and then I have a outer and a lining for each of these sleeves here. So I have four tubes, as it were, just sticking that little homemade arm tailor's ham inside of these to press them open. Again, carefully so that I don't melt this fabric. And then I'm just pressing a half inch hem into the bottom of this because I'm going to hem these sleeves last. Um, but I just want to have this already in here before I even have to deal with it so that I can just sew the two sleeves together at the uh, sleeve hems after I have already set them into the garment and sewn the garment together. Blech. Hopefully that makes any sense. I fear it does not, but alas, that's how my sleeves were done. All right, so here is one of my jackets and I have a sleeve here. I'm going to set these sleeves into these jackets now that the uh, side seams are together, I guess. This is like an iridescent, long iridescent vest at this point. I'm going to put these sleeves in. Um, and again, you can see uh, how the heck am I even supposed to explain what's happening here. I'm just setting the sleeves in. Luckily, they fit. That was kind of what I was testing with the muslin is that that, that adding that fullness throughout the sleeve distributed like that would still mean that these would fit in here. They fit without having to gather them. I didn't even put any sleeve cap gathering in this, which normally I would do, but uh, you just kind of want to touch this fabric with a needle as little as possible because it's so weird. So just setting my sleeves in here, I have, you know, again, the left and the right sleeve in the outer jacket and the left and the right sleeve in the inner jacket. They just happen to be the same fabric, the lining and the fashion fabric for this um, so that everything can maintain its iridescence and sheerness because this is a nonsense garment. But here's a single layer of this. And then I have another single layer and I'm going to put them right sides together <laughs> and back line this entire thing. If I were to make another one of these that was not lined with itself, it'd be much easier to explain as well. <sighs> so there's that. I do have some uh, pretty iridescent-ish green, like olive green taffeta in my stash that I can make another one of these out of actually. What can I line that with though? Hmm. I'll have to look into this because I do have some green taffeta in my stash. And if I have enough, I can make another one of these that makes more sense. And you'll see just how easy this is. Um, it's just this fabric that makes this both hard to make and also hard to explain because visually all that's going on here is like Bleh! dragonfly wings, which while fun is not actually very, it's not good for a, a teaching moment. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just pitting all the outside edges of this together, all along the neckline, all along the front, all along the hem. Um, so the whole thing, you just, you know, you leave an opening to be able to turn it right side out. Uh, I think I left the neckline open actually of this. That's true. I left the neckline of this open. I sewed everything else and the neckline is open because I'm going to put that stand collar on so I can finish it, the neckline with that. So that's, I'm remembering correctly now. Sewing the fronts, the hem, and then the, up the other front and the neckline I'm leaving open to turn this right side out and then to put the collar on. 
and you can see how much this gets puckered or how quickly I accidentally, especially sewing along the hem here, it gets bubbly really quickly. Um, and like, what would be the perfect tension on this? What is the perfect presser foot to use with this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I think I'm very experienced with sewing. I've been doing it for a long time, but that doesn't mean I know how to do everything. Uh, there's always more to learn. And I don't know how to use this fabric. I'm not sure anyone's an expert in it, but if they are, good for them. And they must be a very patient human. And I'd love to hear from them about best practice. But once I had this entirely bag lined, again, I have to clip my corners. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm giving myself a little bit more space than I would normally leave, just because again, this fabric wants to fray a ton. So is that really safe? No. But um, now that this is all together, I'm going into the neckline to pull it all right side out. I'm just going to press this whole thing flat as best I can. Did I do understitching around this edge? No. In any other fabric, I probably would. But in this, I'm just gonna make more puckering and weirdness. So I was trying to keep things as smooth as I could. I will do some top stitching later, so I'm not as worried about having understitching in here for that reason as well. So you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. And this uh, hem was so subtly curved and this fabric so loosely woven that I did not clip my curve on this hem because it's a very subtle curve anyhow. No worries. We can't deny that this fabric is pretty, right? It's very pretty, but also very annoying. I recommend this fabric for lining a sleeve, lining a collar, doing small little bits, accents, and most people don't want an entirely iridescent garment anyway, so fair enough. So for where the fold back will be, uh, along the front of this garment, I'm going to do all of that through top stitching. So here I'm just top stitching to start off along the edge, um, giving myself like a four fourth of an inch from the edge here, all the way down, leaving the needle down, turning the project, coming around all the way along the hem, like so, and going up the other side as just a starting place to begin with the top stitching I would love to have done, fun geometric, Top stitching, kind of like quilting, like you see on those again, 70s, 80s trenches. But it only works so well in this fabric. <laughs> so I'm gonna fold this back the like inch and a half or two inches that it's supposed to be. Yeah, two inches. There you go. Fold this back. Hopefully the two layers are staying aligned, pinning that in place as best I can. Ooh. Like so. Lots of pins for this. The sewing pins don't aren't a problem in this fabric. Um, no problem there. It's just the needle on the sewing machine itself. Which, again, I'm sure there's a best needle, presser foot, tension, and stitch length and thread to be using with this, but I'm sure that I don't have them. I have no idea what thread would be best with this. If there would be something better than just regular old Guterman, you know, kind of. I don't know. I think I used actually dual duty on this. Coats and, Coats and Clark dual duty thread. And then I'm going over my top stitching with that folded now so that this is folded back at the correct area. <laughs> oh man. And then coming off the machine like so. And then I did some geometric, yeah, quilting kind of top stitching on this facing that is folded back. It's all about, <laughs> you know, just kind of staying on the machine. I guess this would be like freehand quilting if you did it for a quilt. <laughs> I think that's what this is called. You can like have a machine that's actually made to do this that has like plenty of space for you to be able to maneuver around and do different shapes and basically draw with a needle. I'm just drawing a very geometric rectangles and just coming around doing kind of a labyrinth of thread. Of course I ran out of thread there so now I have to replace the bobbin and keep going. Not ideal but we're making it work. Again this is a whack garment. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no! I'm sorry to all who are really looking forward to this video. Like it was always going to be an interesting one. Not just a video, but project, because this fabric's evil. You know, what are you gonna do? And in a sense, doing this sort of like quilted pattern is like, if I did one line of stitching, it kind of looks puckered. But if I do like six lines of stitching, it almost looks intentional. You know, we're kind of like making it, oh, we're puckering it on purpose. Yes, exactly. So, you know, once again, there's limitations and uh, difficulties with certain fabrics. And sometimes if you just lean into those, it le uh, lends a better result than fighting them. So that's kind of the idea there. But then I have to attach my stand collar. So let me just press that buddy. How it should be done. Once again, uh, under stitching, usually recommended on this kind of thing. Not in this fabric. I mean, doing a collar in this fabric in general is kind of a, once again, a choice. 
All right, so let's go ahead and pin that onto the neckline. And I'm going to sandwich both layers of the jacket neckline in between the pieces of this collar. But to do so, I'm just going to sew both layers of the jacket to one layer of the collar, and then I'll fold the other layer over the seam allowance eventually here. This is uh, one of those things where like, if you didn't encase this fully, it would be very pokey up on your neck, you know, It'd be quite itchy. Not that this garment isn't itchy anyway, but hopefully you're just wearing it over something. Because again, for the hundred thousandth time, this is just plastic, as I keep saying. I'm just going to pin my jacket along the collar here. You see me do a lot of stand collars here on the channel over the years, if you've been around. Especially this year, I did quite a few actually. And sometimes I even had the fo uh, footage in focus, which would be a fun idea. Yeah. Maybe we'll try it next time. Now I'm really wondering if I have enough of that taffeta to make one of these out of that taffeta. Because I don't know what else to do with that. Problem I have is I really like many taffetas because they come in pretty colors, they're nice and crisp. But like, how many taffeta garments does a gal need? And it's like, <laughs> it's all like formal dresses. You know, how many formal dresses does a gal need? So, yeah. either I'm going to make one of those swingy skirts that I made for like the Madrigora suit, or I'm going to make, and like I already have an olive green one of those, so that would be silly. Or like a swingy coat isn't a bad idea. Hm. I'll have to take that fabric out of the out of the cabinet today and see what's what's up with that, because maybe we can make another one of these in January and you can actually see what I'm doing. Ah. Now I'm pressing all the seam allowance up into the collar, and then I'm folding the collar underneath, uh, folding like the seam allowance of the unsewn side of the collar up. So all the seam allowance is sandwiched in between the layers of the collar up into the collar like so. Um, once again, can you really tell what I'm doing in this fabric? No. Um, also, this is going to be a curvy seam, so you're going to want to clip that <laughs> even in this fray-tastic fabric. Yeah, well, not ideal. Not ideal. All I can say is at least you kind of got an idea of what this garment, this pattern actually looks like in that muslin at the start of this video. I promise we have a nice multicolor, reflective, Tyvek, ridiculous blazer coming up next week that's a little bit easier to understand what's going on. Even if there's more going on, I think it's easier to understand because I'm sewing in a cotton twill, which is behaves beautifully compared to this. Honestly, I'd rather sew in the Tyvek than this, and that is saying something. Because Tyvek uh, doesn't stretch or move. It's not. It's a non-woven. At least this fabric is still a woven, but the Tyvek is not. Um, but even the Tyvek behaves better than this stuff does. Because the Tyvek, you can sew through it no problem. And Tyvek is made to not rip. So it's quite nice, actually. Surprisingly fine for sewing garments that look a little bit like something you would wear to walk on the moon. And to finish this collar, instead of hand stitching it, which is how I usually finish my uh, stand collars, I'm going to top stitch this in the machine just to match the rest of the top stitching. And because it was going to be a lot easier than trying to hand sew anything in this. Um, and because my stitches are going to show in this organza, better to have them just be machine stitches than my hand stitching because my hand stitching isn't very even. Some people have gorgeous, beautiful hand stitching. Not me. Oof, we're nearly done. And again, the shot is not in focus. I gotta talk to this camera gal. Camera operator sometimes. <sighs> but anyway, remember when I said I was going to press the hems of the sleeves in earlier so that it'd be easier to do this later? Well, here we are. So I'm <laughs> now have those edges that are pressed a half inch in on each other so that I can line up this like wrong sides together basically. And then again, I will top stitch the ends of these sleeves with that same sort of like multiple rows kind of a situation um, like I did on the front. So it looks like this when it is done. And that was the last step for this, thank goodness, because what a mess. And here is my finished weird iridescent topper 
you know, it's trying to be a 1980s trench coat, and I'm sure the 1980s would have appreciated the amount of iridescence going on here, but really this is, uh, you know, only halfway to my full vision for this. I might try the silk taffeta version of this fabric in the future to make another trench coat like this that would be a little bit less sheer, but hopefully a little bit better suited to making something structured. In any case, I hope you enjoyed seeing how this project came together today and me working with this very strange fabric. At least it looks nice on camera, even if it isn't the most fun thing to work with. Thank you as always for watching this video today, and I'll be back here with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon, so I'll see you then. Bye!